Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. The thing about grassroots fundraising is you're essentially building your audience as you're fundraising. What's really important is for you to clean up your relationship with money because so many people have such twisted feelings. Oh, I was wondering if my dog was gonna be an issue. She's now uh, chewing listeners. on her pizza. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of The Documentary Life, a podcast that sets out to inspire and educate each and every one of us on what it means as well as how to best lead a documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and I want to thank you for listening to this show and for living your own documentary life. A few years back, Steph and I went to see a documentary film at the local theater here in Portland, Oregon called The Hollywood Theater. We actually didn't know much about the film, but had been hearing a ton about it. The local buzz surrounding it was extraordinary, even for a local director. I wasn't sure that I remembered the name Lydia B. Smith, but felt that I'd recognized her from press pictures as someone that I'd taken a weekend independent movie marketing seminar a while back with. When I arrived to the Hollywood, I was immediately impressed with the sheer amount of people that were waiting to get into the building. The line was substantial, and everyone seemed to be talking about this documentary that we'd come to see, Walking the Camino, Six Ways to Santiago. I'd like to reiterate, and this is by no means derogatory of the film whatsoever, that we weren't so much there to see the film because of its subject matter per se, as much as we were there to simply see what the buzz surrounding it was all about. More than that, we wanted to maybe catch a glimpse of how this buzz was created. Well, to say that we caught more than a glimpse would be a vast understatement. I want to fast forward to about a year later. We're in Long Beach, California, where we've decided to take a fairly substantial go-for-broke type of gamble in order to raise some monies to get back to Cambodia to film on our dock, Elvis of Cambodia. We've taken on a not exactly cheap Airbnb in the heart of Long Beach in order to have a headquarters from which we'll run our Kickstarter campaign. We're hustling and bustling and networking with what is the largest Cambodian American population in the U.S. We're also out filming interviews and meeting with locals and working extra hard to just get the word out about our film. We're reading a book called Crowdfunding for Filmmakers by John Trigonus, and we're channeling our inner Lydia B. Smiths, remembering how after we'd seen her doc walking the Camino, we'd researched her film, finding out that a huge amount of her success with the film had been directly attributed to this sort of grassroots approach that she'd set in motion long before the film was even shot, let alone on the big screen. We were hoping to do a similar thing in the Cambodian American communities in the States, starting with Long Beach. Make a long story short, our Kickstarter campaign was a smashing success, which would allow us to go to film in Cambodia in a month's time. But maybe more importantly, through the course of the campaign, we'd set our own grassroots into motion. We'd connected with so many people during our time in Long Beach that have since helped in some form or another with keeping Elvis of Cambodia in the collective consciousness of Cambodian refugees around the world while we get the film finished. Which brings me to today, where I feel like I've come full circle. And I'm about to share with you a very eye-opening and very inspiring interview with a true Doc Lifer, who I owe an amount of gratitude to. So it'll be nice to thank her in person. Lydia, I'd love to welcome you to The Documentary Life. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of the show today. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I, I also have to I have to admit that I've been sort of a fan from afar for a little oh. bit. Um, since I saw Walking the Camino... I'm going to guess about three years ago, my wife and I, um, Steph and I watched the film and we saw a screening at the Hollywood Theater here in Portland, yeah. Oregon. When both Steph and I went to see it, I, if I'm remembering this correctly, I don't even know that we knew a ton about the film, but we were well aware sort of of this energy and buzz that was being created around it. And I know that Steph and I went to go see it 
as documentary filmmakers with the idea of more observing what was happening and observing what that was all about. Well, that's so funny because I actually felt like there wasn't much buzz happening in the film community. Hmm. It was all in the Camino community. So I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear that. (laughs) And even, and and I couldn't, I can't even speak necessarily directly to whether I heard about it from the film community or where I heard about it. But, but, But for some reason, both Steph and I heard about it we were aware of it and then you know once we actually you know when we did attend that showing we were blown away by sort of what we saw one of the things that we immediately were impressed by was you know we arrived there and then of course there's a lengthy line waiting to get inside it was it was a sold out show of multiple showings i believe i'm sure i'm certain of that yeah right okay i mean you you I assume it's played a number of times in Portland. So do you, yeah, it would played, you know when I'm referring to? Or? Well, you probably came the first week, I'm guessing. Because, because didn't we, it, it played for, to show for quite a while? It played for about three months at the Hollywood. <laughs> and then it played for three months at the living room. So, yeah. um, but we sold out uh, pretty much seven days in a row. And they... It's kind of convoluted. They had us in the big theater, and then they moved us to the small, and then we kept selling it out. So then they moved us back to the oh, big wow. for a couple nights. Then we went back to the small because they had commitments. And, um, yeah. But it's it's. I feel very blessed because it's, it's so much of the Camino that kind of generated that. Um, because what happens is when people get – and I don't know if you were going this way, but yeah. people, when they're interested in the Camino, they get semi-obsessed with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they want to know everything about it. And, and I'm going to stop you right there because I feel like there there may be a number of listeners who don't know what you're referring to when yeah. we're talking about the Camino. Help us out with that. Um, the Camino de Santiago is a 500-mile pilgrimage from the border of France and Spain all the way across the country to the city of Santiago de Compostela, where mm. the remains of St. James are said to be buried. Now, this 500-mile portion is actually, there's many different Caminos. This is what most people refer to as the Camino. It's the Camino the Francis. Camino. It's one of many, but it's the most popular and most well-known. And it's been around for centuries and literally millions of people have done it. And these days, probably somewhere between 250 to 300,000 people do it each year. Incredible. Yeah. So this is a major, this is one of the major, I would say, world sort of treks that that occur. Absolutely. And this is kind of year round. You can do it any time. The peak times are really from Easter through the end of October, but Definitely, there's people doing it in the winter, and if you want more of a solitary experience, that's the time to go. And and and, and just to get back to sort of that event when we were at the screening, um, and I use that word event, and that's perfect because I felt yeah. like it was more we were experiencing more of an event than we were a screening by any means. It was almost as if, there's the film, right? And 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 the film is itself. It, it it it's the film is the film, and then what we experienced before and then afterwards whether it was through you talking to the audience, whether it was through the myriad of volunteers that were constantly around. Yeah. Um, there was there were raffle tickets that were being sold. Saw all the merch. I saw the people walking around with the T-shirts. And everybody has a smile on their face. And they're, everybody's willing to talk about, about the film. Um, and, and I guess I, I was just blown away by sort of the volunteer force that you had there on hand. Of course, Steph and I would then go back, you know, home and and spend a chunk of time researching Lydia B. Smith and researching (laughs) Walking the Camino and how this all came to be and sort of your grassroots approach to this whole thing. From the very beginning, it felt like. This show, The Documentary Life, is about inspiring, empowering, and educating documentary filmmakers. It's about how people can live and lead sort of this idea of a documentary life. I can honestly say that you and what you did with Walking the Camino, it directly inspired both Steph and I as documentary filmmakers. I feel like you instilled in me, by example, the power and importance of building a grassroots campaign. Why don't you start out by telling my audience how that grassroots campaign took shape? Well, ironically, I would actually say it wasn't by choice. 
it was really because of getting turned down by all the big guys. I really wanted some of the big distributors. I wanted the big um, marketing guys. And, you know, I just, I didn't get anywhere with them. I did get some distribution offers, um, but they were just horrendous. And I knew, I knew we could do a lot better. And so... Horrendous financially or horrendous in terms of where it's going to be seen and how many people um, more get, get eyeballs on it. financially and how many people would um it, it just was very limiting and it wasn't yeah. a good deal but that said i also i embarked on the grassroots uh journey from the very beginning and again wasn't really by choice i would have loved to have gotten some big money from itvs or from impact partners or you know all these guys that really have decent money but we didn't get any real significant grants then let's start there let's start with that early part of the grassroots tell us about that necessity and what you did it was an incredibly painful process to tell you the truth because i raised just enough money for the shoot which was about a hundred and twenty thousand dollars and and then we came back. We had no money left. Actually, we ran out of money on the shoot, and yeah, I had to classic. take it out of my retirement. Um, <laughs> but it was it was thirty thousand, which I yeah. paid myself back last year. Oh, so yes. yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a momentous occasion. Great. I'll talk to you about that later, so yeah. Steph and I can learn that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, so then the first year I was doing grants in the traditional, and you know, trying to find significant money because we had three hundred hours of footage. And capturing someone's transformation, you can't just shoot twice. You know, you have to be shooting and shooting. So it's a huge job and it takes a long time. And plus for the shoot, I was able to get people, everybody got paid $100 a day. Yeah, I remember you said that at the premiere, I think even. Yeah. I call it the premiere, but I should say the screening. It was the the Portland premiere because we only did raffles, I think, that first night. There you go, okay. Um, so, So anyway, it was because everybody kind of turned us down for the big money and the big grants i remember the real turning point was i was really in despair about this because here it is you know i put all this time and effort into it and i'm i I can't i don't have the money it's been like a year since i shot and i've you know barely raised anything so i was on a walk with a friend of mine that i went to high school with and she was like lydia why don't you tap our class Um, She goes, some of the people in our high school class have made lots of money. And I went to a private boarding school back east and really great people and um, very a lot of very successful people. So that was really the turning point. So then I really started um, looking for individual donations. And it was really my high school class ended up donating about 40 percent of what I needed to raise. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. And wow. um, four out of five of my executive producers, people that donated more than 10 grand, were were from my high school. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And I had one, one of my donors is pretty well known, um, Dan Brown, who wrote The Da Vinci Code. And he was just so sweet because I, after talking with my friend Alex, I sent a letter out to all my classmates and lots of people sent sent money and then and dan immediately sent a five thousand dollar check yeah and then we had a reunion and i did a little presentation on the film and where i was and what i was doing and he came up to me afterwards and he's like you still need help don't you and i was like yeah i do and he was like well come back to me when you have your rough cut you know because i was in the middle of rough cut but i didn't have enough for sound or color or music or all that stuff and um and so I went back to him, and then he and his wife essentially funded everything from that um, stage. I mean, it was it was tight, but it was fifty grand. Yeah. So it was really a godsend. I mean, it would have taken me probably another three years to do just the post to raise the money and finish. You, in essence, broke the documentary Da Vinci Code. <laughs> <laughs> this is what has happened here. <laughs> well, that's and great. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was. I mean, it was just really tremendous yeah. to get that support from my. And so what it really then, it was my classmates, but it was also, it pretty much boiled down to me asking for money from every single person I'd ever met. 
And the other thing that I've done some talks and I'm teaching a workshop at Northwest Documentary, um, what day is it, July 17th, on fundraising. And one of the things I always tell people is what's really important is for you to clean up your relationship with money. Because so many people have such twisted feelings Oh, I was wondering if my dog was going to be an issue. She's now uh, chewing listeners. on her pizza. <laughs> <laughs> She's got pizza with her. Yes. What I what I've realized is myself included. Mm. Lo- lots of us have issues with asking for money. It makes many of us feel less than or like you're doing me a favor by giving me money so i feel indebted to you absolutely and so that's what needs to get cleared up and i had the great pleasure of working with a woman named lynn twist she wrote a book called the soul of money and she also um is a consummate fundraiser just amazing and she um, she raises over a million dollars one day every year for her nonprofit. Yeah, and and she's like, I love raising money, and she's so she has fun with it. Yeah, she does, yeah. and she's great at it. And I worked with her for I don't know a couple of months, but what I really realized is we really all need to work on that because if you feel reluctant to ask for money, mm-hmm. people are going to be reluctant to give it to you. If you're not... And you feel that, do you think that's because they're thinking you don't have confidence in yourself or you don't think you can pull it off? Why should I entrust that into well, you? Well, maybe. Or, I think it's just a mirroring of energy. Yeah. Things have to match. And if you're like... You have oh, to have vibrations well, that are in alignment with it. Yeah. It has to be in alignment. and. Yeah. So that's one book. Um, there's also a really great book um, I tell people about called Spiritual Economics. Yeah. So that, and then the other thing I encourage people to do is Lynn has a, um, I think it's a three tape workshop called Fundraising from the Heart, and it really talks about fundraising from the line of like I'm giving you an opportunity to invest in what you believe in. Do you think? Right. Do you think, well, for my people, you know, people that have walked the Camino, do you think the Camino is important? Do you think this is something that people should know about? And so it's it's much more of an opportunity, and it's looking at money as a flow. And really, it's an opportunity for people to give. And what most of us have a big problem with is receiving. And if you're asking for money, you have to be able to receive it to be able to keep asking for it. And that's... I was really blessed because so many lessons of the Camino kind of fit so well into the making of the film. For me, the journey of the making the film was so much like walking the Camino and learning how to receive is a big one. Yeah. I I also feel like this was something that, I mean, I've kind of fine tuned, but my father was really a great influence on me in approaching money. My dad was probably a millionaire a couple times and bankrupt a couple times while I was a kid. I mean, it was just, and his attitude was like, ah, it'll come back. And he really kind of gave that to me. And I think also this attitude towards money of like, it's not that I can't buy those shoes, but is that how I value my money? Is that where I want to spend it? Is that really worth it? And so I think it was kind of both, but I definitely had to work the muscle of asking for money. And, um, and it, and it's also what's, what's interesting. This is an important point that I found is so many people are reluctant to ask. So they do it in a very indirect way, which is like by email or by Facebook. And so the closer you get, the more chance I think you have of it happening, the more removed you are, kind of the less likely. So if it's just like a general Facebook post, if it's just an email, it's much easier to ignore an email. The next step is a phone call. The next step is you know visiting someone in person. And so that's something I, I talk about. I mean, I did a lot of fundraising events as well. And I can't say those were really hugely successful. Some of them were. But a lot of them weren't. But the thing about grassroots fundraising is you're essentially um, building your audience as you're fundraising. And these were a lot of the people that then later were volunteering and helping me promote the film when it came to their city. So there's a lot of great things that that can come from that. Steph and I went down to, this would have been two summers ago. Two Yeah, two summers ago. 
before we went to Cambodia to film our latest project, a film called Elvis of Cambodia. We made the decision to go down and spent five weeks down in Long Beach, California. I don't know if you know or not, Long Beach is, the, of course, the highest Cambodia-American um, population in the U.S. Mm-hmm. We made the decision... We kind of, it was kind of one of those go for broke sort of moments. We knew that we needed to go to Cambodia in October for for the bulk of principal photography. In order to do that, we needed to raise X amount of funds. So we wanted to go down to Long Beach, California, where there's this massive Cambodian American presence. And we wanted to network with people down there. We wanted to film interviews. We wanted to run our um, 30 day Kickstarter campaign sort of headquartered down there. We paid a lot of money for to have an Airbnb for five weeks in Long Beach, California. But it was this sort of calculated risk, right? And this this strategy that we that we built around this grassroots approach to raising funds. But the entire time, and 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 we we knew this, we knew this from people like yourself, sort of the template of in your grassroots campaigning, not only are you raising money, but you're building an audience for your film yeah. long before the film will be shown. And so we knew that that was something that we wanted to do down in Long Beach as well. And so that, and of course, the film is not done yet. It, it won't be probably completed until the summer of 2017. But we know that that was huge for us, um, not only in the success of our Kickstarter campaign, but in the awareness around the film. Um, it all started in those five weeks in Long Beach, California, networking with people. It's amazing when you have confidence, you believe in what you're doing, and you start making those asks, and you start meeting with those people. A wonderful thing starts to happen, right? It starts coming back to you, um, whether it's financially or whether it's through word of mouth or through awareness of your film or through, as you know, volunteers that people like, hey, hey, over, I, I, I care about your film. You're doing a film about our country. You're doing a film about our, our culture. That, that that singer means the world to me. I, I, what? Tell me what I can do. I want to help out. And so um, I want to thank you again because uh, what you did with Walking the Camino, I know directly affected us. Um, maybe even having the balls to go down there and do that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely! I'm so glad absolutely. to hear that. So and it was really paid off for you guys. It did. It, it has paid off very well, and I know that it will continue to do so once the film is out. Um, and yeah. this one thing I wanted to just mention yeah. to the listeners, as I stress this, and it's amazing to me how many people don't do this, is that when you're in that phase, you have to collect emails. And you have to remember to collect them because you want to keep these people informed. You want to keep them on your team and you want to be able to contact them. And that's that can get tricky, too, because, you know, navigating and, um, you know, just finding the right databases and way to do that. Oh, totally. Um, And now I'm kind of screwed because you can do MailChimp. (laughs) under 5,000 you get over and then you're like spending a fortune. But anyway, neither here nor there. Um, But that is something super important that a lot of people forget or don't think about doing. The email list is king, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it it is, I I think Steph and I found it, again, it's that that weird energy surrounding the ask. Um, Even something as simple as asking for people's emails I think that we felt that that was a hurdle that we had to get over. It felt it felt uncomfortable somehow initially asking for somebody's email because it's it's that like oh you're gonna spam me aren't you you're gonna send me email about this and you're gonna want this from me and you're gonna want that but we have to get over that what I think so I mean because I, I think it's it's uh, that was one I never had an issue with yeah nice <laughs> I was just because I mean it's like I would explain I and I usually do when I say. I send I you will not get more than one a month and I yeah. think that's something really important to tell people right out the gate yeah and and I want your email so I can tell you when the film is going to be playing totally. in your area so I think and we will target you won't get emails about a screening happening in New York when if you live in Arizona yeah and it's it's just an ask you know like they can say no Who was it or what was it that inspired you to take sort of this grassroots approach? Well, I think it was really in desperation. Sounds like there was was a lot of necessity there. There was there was no other choice. Yeah. Um, That said, there are several documentary filmmakers that have been a huge inspiration for me. 
Um, one is the when I was in college, I took a documentary class, and this woman came in, showed her documentary on incest and child sexual abuse. This was 1986. Mm. People were not talking about these right. things, and this was pretty much the first film. And believe it or not, it was an uplifting film. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to make a difference. And yeah. and so I ended up um, working as an intern for her, um, got school credit, and oh, then wow. she hired me when I got out of college. And she was my second unit director and um, helped me produce this. No and way. Yeah. So she was really an inspiration to me. Um, and then also my good friend Kira, who I produced a lot of documentaries with her okay. when I lived in L.A. Um, but those were all like either for CNN or PBS. They were funded primarily. Totally. Um, so that was a different, but she's definitely a big inspiration for me. Excellent. That's wonderful that you could give back to a person that inspired you by having her on as like second unit director on your doc. Super yeah, it, cool. it was, we were partners for a while. I mean, full on partners, but then her experience was raising money through foundations and through grants. Yeah. And when we hit a brick wall there, she was like, okay, you know, I, this is what I know how to do. We're now in a territory that I don't know how to do it. So then I kind of took over um, pretty much from there in the raising of the money. Okay. Um, and it just really boiled down to necessity because I wasn't going to give up. And that's what a lot of this is all about, perseverance, right? I would say so. And that's for me, for me, making this documentary really feels like part of the reason I was born was to make this documentary. Mm. And when I got the call... Not part of the reason you were born was to make documentaries. No, to part make of, this one. Why? How? I, You know, I, it's hard to put my finger on it. But I, one of the things about the Camino is it really helps you develop your intuition. Or at least it, it did me. And I've always been somewhat intuitive. But I really got the message like, okay, I'm supposed to go walk. So then I walked the Camino. Took a, I took six weeks. And then after I got home, this little voice was just so, you need to do this documentary, you need to do it. And I was super resistant because I had independently produced and directed a short documentary years before, and I swore I would never, ever do it again. Right. Because it was so hard. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I don't want to do this. It's going to be too hard. And a slight resistance because also for me, the Camino was so sacred and amazing. And I felt like, how am I going to do it justice? It's like telling you, okay, you have to capture the wind. Like, how do you even start to do that? And so I was really, really resistant, but it was a really deep calling in me. And I think that probably is the case for a lot of us because it's just too it's such an uphill battle but I guess there are the there's a very small handful of people that you know they get all their docs funded and it's not as much of a struggle but I think for a lot of us it's a big struggle we don't know those people we don't like those people <laughs> I know <laughs> when the, the guy that um oh he like puts out a doc a year uh, <laughs> the guy that did this um the Scientology one and What's his name? Oh, yeah. Um, and did He's the, like, yeah, you know, yeah. Alex a, Gibney. Yes. Of course. Yeah, that seems like that guy's got like multiple docs a year. I know. I'm it's like, how does he do it? Yeah. But it, there's not many of them. You and I have some similarities in how one of our films sort of came to be. In 2006, I had, had done my own sort of trek. And it was in Nepal, and I was with my girlfriend at that time. It was clearly the end of that relationship. And in fact, we were on a 15-day trek um, in Nepal. The, the trek is known as the Annapurna Trek. Yeah. And uh, we were on this trek, and, and that relationship blew up in the middle of that trek. As you know, these things can happen when you're in sort of a confined time period and you're on this sort of this long sort of journey. At any rate, I was at a crossroads in my life my relationship's ending. I, I had left Portland, Oregon at the time, um, I, I thought for good, and uh, I was jobless, certainly, and I really didn't know where the hell it was all headed for me. I didn't know where life was going. And in the middle of this trek, we came upon herds of goats. You'll, you'll see this in the Himalayas. You, you'll literally run into herds of goats, and when I say herds, it's one, two, three hundred goats at a time, and... 
and we kept running into him every couple hours. And every time we did, we'd have to stop and sort of, you know, scoot to the side. Meanwhile, 5,000 feet down is, you know, this precipitous drop and we're, you know, hugging the rock and they're kind of going by us. And at some point I ask sort of our guide, I'm like, man, where, where are these, where are these, why do we keep running into these herds of course? And they all seem to be going in the same direction. And he said, yeah, man, they're, they're going to Kathmandu. It's like, oh, really, really? What, what's happening in Kathmandu? Well, they're going to their deaths. It's sort of a matter of fact thing. And, and then, you know, I come to find out that, that we had been there, happened to be during the time of this sort of all important uh, Nepali festival in India as well called Desai, where at the height of it, they sacrifice uh, 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 sacrifice goats to the goddess Durga. And so it dawned on me that these sort of goats were on this sort of once in a lifetime journey that they make. And, and certainly, you know, I projected my own sort of thoughts and, and, and life crises in the moment. And, and I just felt like I, I felt somehow connected to the goats in this very like Werner Herzogian sort of way. Right. And, and I felt like I have to tell their story or i have to tell the story of this sort of journey that they make and I, and I made these you know parallels with what was happening in my life with the death of my relationship mm -hmm. sort of the death of sort of who i was prior to this and 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 i would of course a couple of years later i would come back and make journey to Kathmandu. i found parallels there with sort of our journeys um and, and I wanted to share that with you well, I, with Walking the Camino. Of course, and one of the reasons journey. I went to Walk the Camino was um, I was engaged to be married was not the right fit. I, I and yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Did you set out to go on the trek sort of as a, medit a walking meditation to think about this or think about life? Or you know, did that happen naturally really, during the course it was, of it? It was really more I just wasn't sure what to do or where I was going. And because... I had moved to Santa Cruz to be with my ex fiance and, yeah. and lived there for a while. And then when it was clear that this was not the right fit, I was like, where do I go? Do I go back to LA? Do I go back to Ashland? And I wasn't really sure where to go or what to do. And I was in a, um, a month long workshop, a work study program at Esalen. And um, that's when I finally decided. I to do the Camino and I had yeah. heard I had known about the Camino because I had lived in Spain and everybody knew about it and it had come to me I guess in about January like oh this is a possibility and the more I learned about it I was like okay that's what I'm gonna do and so it was really more like you know I just didn't know where my life was going where I should live what I should do and so it was like okay I'm just gonna go do this for yeah. now and then yeah. I'll figure it out and did you figure it out uh it figured me out, I guess you would say. I mean, I, I did decide to move to Portland. Um, I was also toying with the idea of Vermont. I have a lot of family back there. See that. And um, but it was my both my parents are on the West Coast and I was like, I can't live that far away and yeah. And so I did decide, okay, I'll come to Portland and then it was just super strong, you need to make this film. And I tried in the beginning to get some big funding and um, you know, didn't really get anywhere. This is a very simple existence and it's a very addictive kind of existence. You get up in the morning, you put everything you own into one bag and you walk. I mean, I know, I know I'm even some, and I don't know if this is going to make it into the show at all or not. If, you know, um, I know that I'm even sometimes hesitant to, to speak in ways of talking about um, manifestation, right, or manifesting, or or this idea of energy or vibration, um, because I don't want to. Uh, I worry yeah. that that will scare people off. Yeah. But um, and I have my own sort of struggles with that. I grew up on the East Coast. Uh, I'm natural. I, I, I'm I'm. I'm cynical of things. Uh, I'm I'm a pessimist often, and I work damn hard at not being that way. But it's really hard not to because it's just sort of ingrained in my upbringing. Um, I at least believe that a positive energy can. How can a positive energy not garner you more success with whatever you're trying to do than negative energy? Yeah. And with this show, with the documentary life, a big part of it is inspiring belief in people, inspiring people to believe in themselves, educating where and when I can or where and when my guests can. So I, I, I will at times talk about what you believe and what you think are very important 
elements to your success later on because I, I know it's worked for me and it's definitely worked against me when I'm not applying these principles. Yeah. And I also, I feel, I so believe in a lot, all that and also sometimes things happen. And yeah. sometimes I remember my one of my practitioners said, sometimes things happen so you can see how far you've grown. Oh yeah. And so it's one of those things that I think we can get so caught in blaming ourselves or blaming someone else for you know, things not turning out the, the way, way we way want, hoped, yeah. not realizing there's probably a silver lining in there somewhere, we just haven't seen it. I mean, one of the things I think about a lot is my brother passed when I was 10, and it was horrendous and horrible, and I wouldn't wish it on any family because it just tears apart everything. And yet, I wouldn't have made this film if my brother hadn't had died because I wouldn't have gone away to boarding school. I wouldn't have gone to school year abroad my junior year in high school. I wouldn't have had my Spanish family. I wouldn't have known about the Camino. I wouldn't have been bilingual. <laughs> and I also wouldn't have had, having experienced such an intense tragedy as, as a young child and maybe some of the other things that had happened in my life, you know, I, I feel like I can talk to people about death. I can talk to people about difficult things because I've been there. Right. You know, if I had this happy-go-lucky childhood, you know, and I'm like trying to delve deep into you and your story, you know, for my film or, you know, it, it, it takes having been there or it takes being comfortable with those emotions. And because I've had them, I can go there. There were per some people on my crew that were really uncomfortable with the emotions. And one of them said at one point, he was oh. like, are you going to make everybody cry? And I was like, and not, you know, people weren't, I wasn't making them cry. I was just allowing them to cry, right. to express their feelings. Right. And, and, but it's so interesting. So many people are so uncomfortable with that. And, you know, going back that I, I feel like I had that because of, my own personal tragedy as a child. Of course. I think that as human beings, we have these histories in our lives. And if we can look back in our histories, like you just did, we can see what has led us each step along the way. And so it's dangerous to wish that something didn't happen early on in your life, as painful and traumatic as it was, because you probably would not be doing what you're doing or you yeah. wouldn't be doing what you will be doing if not for those events, which led to this event, which led to the next event and to the next. Yeah. One of the things that I like to ask my guests is about this idea of leading a documentary life. I've rarely met someone who makes their living exclusively doing documentaries. But through the course of this podcast, I have talked with people that have found ways to sort of lead documentary lives. I know that I have a number of listeners who... Documentary films are their passion, and it's what they do, that's what they live for. But that's not necessarily what's putting the proverbial rice on the table. And so they're working um, in other other arenas in life, whether it's they could be working at a convenience store, you know, down the street. They could be valeting um, at a hotel down the street, which is what I did 10 years ago. How are you sort of leading a documentary life? Because I don't feel like we've gotten to that yet. I don't know. Um, are you making your living doing documentary films? I would say no. Right. Um, I When I lived in L.A., I generally did about one doc a year. Um, and the rest of the time I was a camera assistant and camera operator. Yeah. And that's where most of my money came from. Yeah. And the docs paid, but they didn't pay great. Um, and then for this film... I had a very unique situation. I had a house and some land that I sold. And so that's what I lived on in the making of the film. Oh, I and see. Okay. so, but the film now finally is supporting me, um, which <laughs> a very many years later. Yeah. But, but, but I also have to say, I, the film paid most of my bills. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't, pay me to I didn't pull a salary but it paid you know the the K, the internet you know it paid yeah. for I had it pay for a lot of stuff which my whole life I mean my life was 110 percent my film for six years right I'm just now starting to have something outside of my of the Camino um but 
so it paid for a lot. But I mean, and that's kind of the disheartening thing. I mean, and I I hear so many people say you have to pay yourself first. And there yeah, was yeah. a point when there was enough money coming in and I had to, I had to choose. I could either pay myself or I could have an assistant. And I chose to have an assistant because yeah. I knew I could not do it by myself. I couldn't emotionally like go through each day and not have somebody else there with me. Um, and so that was really important for me. And so I made a choice. It was either going to be her or me. And she was fantastic. Casey England, or she's now over at Leica. And, um, you know, she really kept me going really hard worker. And so during those tough times, but I don't know that many people, especially independently. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's tough. And I feel very blessed, you know. I mean, I had this house and this land that, that I sold. And um, and so I was able to pay the other bills that I needed to. But I did, you know, I have a home office. And one of the few probably floating edit suites um, anybody will ever see. Tell us about that because <laughs> we're, we're having the interview here. I, I'm conducting this interview here and, and, and I'm looking out on the Willamette River here in Portland, Oregon, and literally the, the river is a, a feet from us, really? Like <laughs> well, or it's actually... Underneath uh, us right? entirely? <laughs> it's completely underneath us. But yeah, it's I, I love living on a floating home, and I nice. used... All of my house was was um, office space, essentially, at the height of it. This was the um, headquarters for walking the Camino? Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. This would be a, a super cool, cool place to live, I would, I would imagine. That'd be great. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it here. I remember um, when I was in high school, I was working three jobs to make enough money to go back to Spain. And one of them was cleaning houses. And I remember cleaning a couple house floating homes. And I was like, this is really cool. See, maybe yeah. you were manifesting it then. <laughs> yeah, maybe, you know, but I mean, I was That's cleaning the toilet. Awesome. I had the it doesn't toilet always look pretty. <laughs> doesn't always look pretty. But it does now, um, yeah. and congratulations! It's just, this is really cool, and I'm excited to have finally met you in person. It's really yeah, cool. me too. Me um, too. Why don't you tell us how we can see Walking the Camino currently? Um, right now, um, it's uh, on our website, which is Camino Documentary dot um, org. You can also find it on Amazon and yeah. um, th those other kind of iTunes. If you would rather support the shareholders of Apple and Amazon, that's where you can go. Um, or you can support independent filmmakers by going to our website, which is CaminoDocumentary.org. And that's awesome. one of the things, I mean, there's a couple of things I would, I would love to tell filmmakers, don't make a film unless you have to. And if you have to make this film, then go for it. Yeah. But if you're just kind of like, oh, it'd be kind of cool. I mean, maybe make a five minute. You know, make something really short. But it it is hard, but I feel like it, it comes from so deep within us that this is what I'm meant to do. Um, and in distribution, one of the things I I do want to tell people is, is, is I, I feel like I was incredibly lucky. There was, I, it just happened. I heard the call, I'm supposed to make this film, and I did. So I didn't look at, you know the market and i didn't i did try right. and see what films were already out there but i was really listening to my own passion and then it turned out just synchronistic the timing was perfect um but so that said i think i was in a unique position where there was really a need for this and so we were really successful and it, you know a theatrical release isn't for everybody but I think what's important is for people to really listen to themselves and know their audience, know who they are and try and connect with them. One of the key things I tell people is if your film's in a festival, you cannot nor should you rely on the festival to promote it. It's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Essentially being a documentary filmmaker, probably only 20% of the time. The rest of the time you're a fundraiser, you're a promoter, you are doing a gazillion other things. And, and that's just the reality of it because I think it's a total shame if you spend three years, five years making your film and then you, you get your you know, Gravitas or one of these big distributors 
and then that's it. That's I it. mean, who you, saw the film? Did did did, it, did anybody see it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to spend that much time and energy making a film, you should put in a, equally, if not more, in the marketing and distribution of it. And I feel strongly about that because. I mean, unless you do get picked up by somebody huge, nobody is going to have the passion for it that you will. Are you making a case, Lydia B. Smith, for self-distribution versus a major picking up your film? Well, I think it's, you know, on a case-by-case basis, Mm -hmm. and it depends on what they're offering you. Like, I had a minor distribution deal offered to me, and it was clear, like, this isn't good enough. I can do better. And so I think... I mean, I think it just depends. Um, I mean, I would have loved to have had, you know, some submarine entertainment come on, Josh Braun come on board. And, you know, I would have loved all that, you know, and had like what happened with Blackfish, you know, the amount of press and have like, you know, a major publicist and all that. But, you know, we did it small. We did it city by city. And that's one of the other things that I think people make a big, big mistake is the... The big guys, they release in L.A. and New York first. And they do it, I think, to get reviews and to get. But those are the toughest markets out there. And I see a lot of doc filmmakers go to New York and L.A. first. And I'm like, no, no, exactly. No. No Go to where you're strongest first. And and also, I mean, we'll be going to Stockton, California. We'll be going to Lowell, Massachusetts, Long Beach, California, like the places where we know the communities are. That's the way to building that grassroots. That's the way to do it. Yeah. But I mean, and but I just it's it's so funny because I think the rules are so different with big movies versus littler ones. And I think one of the things that the reason it was successful is was I was able um, I had the time, and I I did get a grant for some distribution stuff for the tour from um, a Spanish organization. Oh wow, great! That I got thirty thousand awesome. dollars, which allowed me to launch the tour because yeah. we got a booker and we got um, I got an RV. I mean, that didn't pay for the RV, okay, but it yeah, paid yeah. for the wrapping yep. of the branding of the film on totally. the RV and going city to city and making it an event because yeah. that was what why I think a lot of theaters took us is because they want events. They want filmmakers coming in. So if you can make yourself available to do that, that makes a big, big difference. But I, I definitely, I mean, I do definitely tell people that it, it's so important for you to be involved in the distribution and marketing because nobody else cares as much as you do. Exactly. That's perfect. Yeah. I'm so glad that you remembered to say all that because, I mean, that's invaluable I think advice for a lot of my listeners, for sure. Yeah, I'm trying to, I it's mean, huge. there's all these other things that I, you know, people keep asking me and I, I need to put this all down. Well, you should be writing a book. I I'm, I'm actually surprised. Okay, there's a part of me that's happy that you haven't done that yet because the cynical side of me, like, oh, of course, now she's going to write a book about it. <laughs> but I actually, hearing you speak and and knowing how it's helped me as a filmmaker, I definitely think that you should strongly consider that. I think you have Thank a lot you. to offer people. You speak from experience. Um, you speak from maybe even more importantly from passion. And uh, I think that your words can help a lot of people. They already have. Um, and they will continue through interviews like this. But I think if you would think about maybe writing a book, that's something that you might consider. Well, I've, I'm sure you have. I have about, been yeah. thinking about it. It's just uh, this year has been sort of more about my own recovery. I mean, I the only thing is, I mean, I I worked my ass off for seven years. And and it, it's had it's taken a bit of a toll. Yeah. I mean, my adrenals are shot and – um, I'm I'm building them back up, but I really pushed hard. And in that said, I don't have any regrets about okay. it um, because one of the things that was really important to me is the message of the film. For me, the bottom line message is to inspire people to do what they're meant to do. Yeah. And like you doing this podcast, I look at this, I'm like, holy cow, the amount of time and work and energy that you put into this. And what a service to people making docs that are just beginning or don't know where to go and don't know. I mean, what an incredible service. And so Thank you. for me, like, if I had one iota of, you know, connection with this and inspiring you to, to do this, oh, yeah. to me, that's so meaningful because yeah. 
you're providing a service and you're following your your path and what you're meant to do. Right, right. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I feel strongly about it as well. It's it's nice to hear it's nice to hear um, validation from someone like your like yourself. That's that's I appreciate that. And I don't and, and you can hear me stumbling because I don't do well with compliments. So <laughs> moving on. Um, thank you again, Lydia. It's wonderful. Well, really thank appreciate you. it. Hey, it's me again, Chris. I want to just take a moment to thank you for listening to The Documentary Life. And I know that you get this, but I really think it bears repeating. Without you, this podcast doesn't exist. So if you like what you're hearing with The Documentary Life, I'd like to ask you for a little help. And there are two ways in which you can do this. They're super easy, but it'll go a long way in helping out the future of this podcast. One, I'd like to hear from you. I want you to share with me some of your experiences and insight into this world of documentary filmmaking. We all have our own stories and wisdom, and we need to share them with one another. So I'd like to encourage you to email me at chris at barongfilms.com. That's chris, C-H-R-I-S, at barongfilms.com, B-A-R-A-N-G, films.com, and share some of your stories, insight, and inspiration. And then I'd love to be able to share some of this with the listeners of the program. I mean, wouldn't it be really cool to start a bit of a support group through this podcast? Again, that email, chris at barongfilms.com. Now, the other way that you can help me out significantly is by giving this show a five-star rating and writing a quick review over at iTunes. And while there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the podcast and or downloading the episodes. I know that everyone says this, but it truly is the most effective way to get the show seen and heard by more people that visit iTunes, especially over the course of the next few weeks, where we're vying to get into what's known as iTunes' new and noteworthy section. It's through the ratings, subscriptions, and downloads that we stand a good chance at getting into the new and noteworthy section. Why is it important to get highlighted here? More visibility for the show, which means more listeners, which means more downloads. You get the snowball effect here. So please, if you like what you're hearing with The Documentary Life, consider heading over to iTunes and giving the show a five-star rating, writing a review, and subscribing to the podcast. In advance, thank you for helping me out with this. As you know, I'm pretty new to this podcast thing, so any and all support is massively appreciated. Till next time, I remain your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. So long, thanks for listening, and keep on living your documentary life. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.